Test one, two. How about that? Can you hear me now? Is that a little bit better? Is that a little bit better out there on the stream, streamland? Y'all can hear me good now. On, can you hear it? Amen. Just want to make sure that we're getting good volume. Amen. On the stream. How's everybody looking? Amen. Church family. Is anybody on the stream? Can, is anybody on the phone looking at me? Can you hear me on the stream right now? I know it, there's like maybe a 10 second delay or something. I know from a live setting to a... Uh, of course, the setting we have in here to the people that are at home. Very good. Okay, so there we go. Yeah, we're hearing it now pretty good. Okay, so let's do this. And of course, the people got to turn me down, turn me down out there in, in, in streamland. Amen. <laughs> we got a lot to do tonight. So we're going to jump into some stuff. You know, we've been talking about the gospel. And you know, I just really felt impressed that uh, before we get out and begin to do some work, and I'm hoping that in the, in the, maybe in the weeks or months to come, that we can provide a way or, or an avenue where we can go and share the gospel or maybe put into a process, maybe some, some way where you can begin to articulate the gospel at your job or maybe on Facebook or give you an opportunity where maybe even the church, we can maybe make some videos of people sharing the gospel or even sharing their testimonies. I just think it's so essential that you understand the gospel. And I know that a lot of times when people hear that, you know, everybody thinks, oh, I know the gospel. But maybe you don't, amen, and so it's just so important that we talk about that, and I'm going to share some things tonight that I believe are going to be instrumental in that, and then we'll, we'll turn you loose tonight, but we're going to talk about some stuff that I really believe is going to help you understand the gospel more completely, more thoroughly, amen, so let's do this, let's pray, and let's, we'll get ourselves kind of organized in the spirit, amen, and then we'll get, like we say, put our spiritual caps on and get out of uh, any natural thinking, we'll get into that supernatural thinking that the Holy Spirit will bring us into. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've made. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to rejoice in it. And I thank you, Father, for what you're doing at Harvest Point Church. I thank you for what you're doing with the family of faith. I thank you because tonight we're going to uncover and discover many wonderful truths of the word of the Lord. I pray that it be applicable. I pray that we hear it. I pray that, Father, as we get out into our work environments, into conversations, into our socialization, wherever that may be, I pray that we be vessels of your word and vessels of the gospel. And so I pray blessing and help and strength as we move forward tonight, and we pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen. So let me do this real fast. I know that many of you, we've been, we were getting into the gospel, and for some of you that have been tuning in, and I know that maybe you catch them Wednesday night or Sunday night. I hope that you catch them all the time. So essential that you understand the teaching that you know we're in is kind of blocked off in such a way that if you miss one or two sessions, you're going to be pretty far behind, or at least in the thought and mode of your church as we're trying to walk in harmony in the Word, right? And so, uh, what we were doing is we were talking about how to walk in the Spirit, how to mind the Spirit. And every time I got on, I was going through and giving, you know, excerpts from the previous class that so everybody can kind of walk at least in concert, at least for the 30 or 40 minute we have our Bible study. And so the reason why we taught how to mind the Holy Spirit is because one of the last things we talked about was in the gospel is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you know that when you share the gospel, I'm so thankful that, you know, the scriptures say that God chose something so foolish, and I say foolish, something so simple as the gospel, that he, he might confound the wise of the world, right? That he would use something, as the Bible says, as foolish as the preaching of the gospel, 
that people might be saved, right? And so what happens in that is that God was trying to use something so simple in the preaching and declaration of the gospel that men would be saved. Now we think salvation is a very complicated process and people think people getting saved is a very difficult thing to do, whereas the scripture calls it a very simple thing because the power of the Holy Spirit is in the gospel, right? So important that you understand if you want to manifest God somewhere, declare the gospel. Share it. Let somebody know. It sounds like a simple message, but the, but the declaration of the gospel invokes the very power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you, you lay hold of that and understand that. Listen, you may try to persuade people into the gospel, and I'm here to tell you, you don't need no persuading. Jesus doesn't need no persuasion. You declare the gospel and let the Holy Ghost do the work. Somebody say amen to that. So important that you understand that. Just because we're kind of getting back into the, into the flow or into the flux of that particular conversation, open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm actually going to be preaching a little bit of a piece of this particular text just on Sunday morning because I just think there's some, some essentials that need to be said concerning what I call the preaching of the cross. And I'm going to preach the cross on Sunday. It's going to surprise you some of the things that you might hear when I preach the cross. But I want to, I want to introduce you to St. Matthew, pardon me, Saint, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in here, I'm just going to read the gospel as, as it was delivered unto Paul. But then I'm going to get into something maybe a little bit more, I don't want to say complicated, but maybe a little bit more history in the teaching of the gospel. And then I'm going to reveal to you some words that I think are instrumental in comprehending, or at least in Paul's comprehension, the fullness of what the gospel really means. So if you're in 1 Corinthians 15, this is where the what is. 1 Corinthians 15 is what? The gospel. If you don't know that, you need to know that because I would, I would hate for somebody to stop you on the street, say what church you go to, and then you say Harvest Point, and then they say, well, where's the gospel? And you don't know. I, it would be an embarrassment to me, and it'd be an embarrassment to the brothers and sisters of church if we don't know where the gospel is. And of course, Paul outlines the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read a, a few passages here, actually down to verse 4, and you'll see that Paul, Paul is giving that which was delivered unto him by the apostles. But I'm going to talk to you about something about that concerning that particular thing. Look what it says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Do you know that Christ died for your sins? Amen. And what, 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 what a paradox we live today where people uh, make no note of sinfulness and we're in that culture and generation. I would even say it's probably in the church where we make very little of the word that, you know, was pretty much paramount when I grew up, that word we call sin. But he says how Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, what it says, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And of course, that's all prophetic in, in that sense. And he's given it to you as such. And he says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Of course, that's all expressions even there. Some of y'all know even Isaiah 53 is part of that prophetic word concerning the Lord. And so that is essential. I want you to get that. That's, that, 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 that's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. And we're just rehearsing what we probably rehearsed several months ago about the gospel. So that's the gospel. So important that you get that. There are elements in there that I want to share with you. So let me read something to you because I want to show a distinction today between the man, Apostle, Apostle Paul, and Apostle Peter. And I just want to give uh, a little bit of direction there so that you can see this. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Some of y'all know uh, I wrote down Acts 2, and we'll read a little portion out of Acts 2, and then we'll jump over. And I just want to show you something because I'm going to give you some key words about the gospel that I help you to share the gospel when you share it. And I'm hoping one of these uh, next couple of weeks or, or months that we might go out and just share the gospel at, at, you know, I don't know, right here at Quick Trip, right, right across the street, just, just share the gospel and, and, and just share it with people. I don't know, we might, we might go some public place and just, just be, you know, ask people if they need prayer. We're going to set up a prayer booth that people come by and, uh, you know, do you know the Lord? I don't know, just give people an opportunity to share the gospel. Come on, somebody. 
You got to be excited about that. That's a wonderful window and opportunity for you. The Bible says a man that saves souls is wise. And so I pray that you understand how important that is for us to know the gospel. Acts chapter 2. Some of y'all know Acts chapter 2. Of course, this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want you to slide your finger down to verse 36. I could read the whole Acts 2. I'm saying this namely because at the beginning of verse 14 of Acts 2, Peter gives reason for uh, not, only, not only the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but he gets into some detail about the crucifixion of Christ. I want you to hear Peter say this, and then I'm going I'm to read uh, some out of, you know, j- just here, I'll, I'll read even, even out of verse out of Acts 4, but let me just read Acts 2, begin at verse 36. He says, Therefore let us let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, right, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so that was that was Peter's expression of the cross, that Jesus was crucified. What should we do? We should repent. And I think some of y'all know that that was also of the message that Jesus Christ shared in his day that we should repent, right, and believe. And this is, of course, what, what, what Apostle Paul, pardon me, Apostle Peter is teaching here in Acts chapter 2. I noted that there was in Acts 4, another expression of that where, let me just read this to you. Of course, y'all know Acts chapter 4, uh, this, particular, this particular place. Of course, uh, I'll, I'll read this to you, Acts chapter 4, just to rip over chapter 2. I'm, I'm giving to you something unique about Peter, and then I'm going to compare him to Paul, show you some distinctions here. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? And of course, some of y'all know there was a mighty miracle that took place. Some of y'all know that this is in reference to the young man to whom they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise. You know, y'all know that story, right? When he told him uh, to rise and walk. And of course, the lame man who was lame from birth rose up and went into the temple rejoicing. And so they were questioned and they said, and, and, and when they had put them in the midst, they asked him, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and, and elders of Israel, this is verse 9, Acts 4, 9, and we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole. And then notice what Peter says here. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand here before you whole. So I want you to see how Peter was transitioning and understanding and coming to some understanding of the crucifixion of Christ and the power of that crucifixion. And of course, we know he was there standing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to see that it was Peter who actually was understanding and, and beginning to comprehend the power of the resurrection through the, the, the preaching of the cross and through the declaration of the cross, he began to walk in the power of that resurrection. And that's a uniqueness there of Peter. Notice that Paul is somewhat, is un, was uniquely gifted. I'm going to have you go with me to Galatians. And I want to read a passage of scripture here, Galatians 1, to show you in their ministry, in their ministry, how God was using them distinctly, right? And there was something that was happening in the life of Apostle Paul. Some of y'all know Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus. The Bible says that while he went, there was a, y'all know the story of Paul on the road to Damascus. Is everybody here familiar with, the, with Paul to Damascus? How he was, a, a light came and knocked him off his horse and it was Jesus who spoke to him, asked him why he was persecuting him and, and, and he, he was uh, introduced to Christ uh, the, the post-resurrected Christ, and from there began the journey of Paul in his, in his Christian faith. Notice what happens here. Go with me to Galatians 1. Go with me to Galatians 1, and I want you, I want you to go with me to verse 9. I'm going to read all the way through here because I want you to see something unique about Apostle Paul. So watch this. 
Verse 9, and we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any of the gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Come on, somebody. For do I, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if it yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Watch what happens. There you go. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Now this is a very, watch Paul, watch what he says. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, come on, we know about that, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Here we go and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly jealous of the traditions of my fathers. And Paul's, Paul's been very good to renounce that, to call all that but dung. But notice what happens here. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's room and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, Immediately I convert not with flesh and blood. This is interesting. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Now watch this. Watch what Paul says. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. This is Acts 9. So notice that Paul didn't immediately go into the, into the field. Paul has always contended that it was Jesus who taught him the gospel. That he learned this from Jesus himself. So he didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from the apostles. For three years, he listened to the voice of God through the Holy Spirit to receive the gospel. Isn't this amazing? He says, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. That's, of course, 1 Corinthians 9. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came unto the regions of Syria and, Cecil, and, and Cilicia and was, and was unknown by the face of the churches in Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed and, that, and they glorified God in me. So P Paul is now saying, that, that people began to understood and he began to gain uh, some notoriety and that here is the one that persecuted us but now preaches the faith. Now we're, look at verse 2. Look at, look at, look at chapter 2 of, of Galatians. Uh, look what it says. Then 14 years after. Did y'all see that? Then 14 years after. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So I want you to see that Paul is delivering to you that which he learned of Christ, and it took many years for Paul to prepare right, what I would call the theology of our gospel. So I want, you to see, I want you to see Peter on one hand already operating in the power. Somebody say amen. That is amazing. I just want you to see that immediately after the Holy Spirit fell, Peter was already in the power. And I want you to be in that power. Somebody say amen. It didn't take him 17 years to prepare ministry work. and to, He was already in the power of the gospel. Listen, brothers and sisters, when you share the gospel, you unleash the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Listen, don't try to persuade somebody. Well, listen, you got to come to church. When you come to church, your kids are going to grow up. They're going to hear about the Bible, and you're going to have a place to come fellowship with people, and there's nice people at the church. And Man, if you ever need some gas money, surely somebody will hold you, give you a 20 or a 30, or if you ever run out of food, people are there. You know, we got all these reasons why, other than the gospel, other than the gospel, right? We're supposed to share the message of the gospel because in the gospel is the power of the Holy Spirit which produces the change that we're after, amen, that we would love to see. Somebody say amen to that. That's, that's incredible. I just want you to see that Paul is now beginning to teach some very core tenets of the church, and he begins, in fact, in fact if you'll do, do this with me, go with me to 2 Peter, and let me show you that, that even Peter, who is, you know, I, I count Peter as the unofficial spokesperson, maybe the, 
If I could call anybody bishop, I'd call, bishop, I'd call Peter the bishop, right? 2 Peter chapter 3, I want, you, I want you to see this, that even Peter was learning from Paul what the gospel meant. So here's a man that's operating in the power and in the function of the Holy Spirit who he himself is having to learn from Paul what is the meaning of the gospel. Somebody say hallelujah. I mean, uh, how many of you, I mean, uh, Brother Castillo's not here, to, here tonight when we needed him the most. Uh, I have to tell him, Brother, we, we, Elder, we needed you on, on Wednesday night. He has a Corvette, right? And, and he knows all about the power of it. I promise you, if you ever ask him, have you ever lit the tires up? He probably said, yeah, a couple times. You know, when you have a fast car, you're going to, you know, you're going to light it up every now and then. Anybody have a, have a fast car or something that's got some wheels on it? And every now and then you, you, you lay a scratch here and there just to, you know, that's what it's about. But you may not know how to fix it if it breaks. You know all about the power, but you just don't know how it works. Did I get somebody? Can you understand that? See, Peter knew all about the power. He just didn't know how it worked. Paul came to teach you how it works. You catching that? That's, that's a key distinctive in their ministry, right? So look, look, look what Peter says. Are you there in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15? Here he talks about it. Verse, verse 15, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And the account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, right? And the account that the long-suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation, right? Let's get into that issue. The gospel, salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they, are, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So he's given you this very clear admonition that Paul is delivering unto you the necessity, the learning of the gospel, right? So essential you catch that. So there are some key elements, and I want to introduce those tonight. Let me see what time it is. I've got a few minutes, and we'll, we'll get, go as far as we can. And I'm just going to, I'm going to put them up here on the overhead, and I want you to catch them. Write these down. So we're talking about the working of the gospel. Because you need to know these things, brothers and sisters, so that not only will you understand your, your salvation, right, What's, what God did for you, so that you can begin to convey these components to those that you share. These are key words. These are the teachings of Paul. Redemption propitiation, reconciliation, justification. Did y'all see that? So I'm going to give those to you again. So redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, justification. And we're going to talk about those tonight. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get into uh, some conversation. In fact, let's get into this, this thing called redemption. Yeah, so, so yeah, go ahead and write those down. There's four things. Redemption. I, next, I, I've set one apart because I'm going to talk about the blood of Jesus. I'm going to set that apart. That, that's going to, I would put it up here, but I'm going to discuss it at, at a later, maybe on Sunday night, our Sunday night Bible. So I won't talk about the blood of Jesus or maybe next Wednesday. We'll see how far we get. We may not get through all of them tonight, but those are key things, right? So Peter wasn't, none of the apostles, none of them taught this. You will find no reference to redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, justification, except on behalf of Paul, that who taught this. I want you to see distinctly that Paul was taught, given the message of the gospel, to who? To the Gentiles. This, this is new stuff, people. This, this isn't Judaism. This wasn't known to the Jew. This was made known to you. Somebody say hallelujah. Right, see, so, so the Jews got their system. Listen, you talk to an Orthodox Jew, how many know they got a system, right? They got a system. They're even talking about finding that red heifer. I don't know if you know, they're trying to find that perfect heifer so they can begin their, 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 you know, their expression of atonement, their expression of, of forgiveness, right? Their day, right, where they celebrate that expression. We here, believers, we have something much greater. And I'm going to talk about how beautiful this is. So these are words that you need to know. You sh these should be part of your, you know, your, your conversation in Christ. 
should include these things and of, and of course the blood of Christ which I'll get to at a later time which is not on the overhead right now but it's essential that you get these so redemption propitiation reconciliation justification I'll take those all in that order there I think there's some that may in my opinion redemption I'm going to talk about that on Sunday morning there's a there's a distinction there with that word redemption but just so let's do this so when you buy so in your notes write this down so the, the, the word redemption, I'm just going to give this to you. The word redemption is to buy out. Yeah, buy out. B, B U Y out. Buy out. Right? Redemption is to buy out. So, how many knew Jesus bought you out? Right? He bought you. You don't belong to yourself, you belong to Him. You were bought with the price. Right. In, in fact, <laughs> I'm going to get into a whole another conversation here. People are going to get mad at me. I know I'm going to I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers, but it's OK. Because I have to teach you this. You, you, you don't you don't you don't own yourself. You're owned by God. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Let's go to first Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six. So you saw the word you're, you've been bought out. So God bought you. Right. How many? How many remember the story of Hosea? How many know the story of Hosea? I always use the story of the prophet Hosea because Hosea is, Hosea, God asked, listen, can, can you imagine, and I, I'm going to talk to some, some parents here. How many parents here have sons? You have parents or you have a son, right? And, and, and I, I'm going to use a son in particular just because I think the application is, because there's symbolism. Hosea is, Hosea's life is the symbol, his expression is Hosea is the symbol of the heart of God towards men, right? It's the heart of God towards men. In that Hosea, Hosea was commanded to marry a prostitute. Yeah, the prophet Hosea, the prophet Hosea was commanded to marry a prostitute. Now, I don't know how many women are in here if you had a son. I don't know that you would be advocating, hey, hey son, if you can't find any, you know, you can always... You can always go down, you know, to that part of Dallas, Harry Hines, and I'm sure there's a woman out there, you know, please you and, you know, be with you. How many would ever advocate your son to marry a prostitute? I think you understand that's a pretty odd thing to do, right? Somebody who was unfaithful. Hosea marries her, and if you notice all of his kids, I don't know if you know this, but if, you know, if you go through all of his kids, they all have very particular names. One of the kids' names, that's not mine. One of them is, I think this is mine. Yeah, if you go through, learn their names. Go, you go, I'm not going to get it. I didn't come here to extradite Hosea. I just, I just want you to see how odd it was that Hosea was commanded to marry a prostitute and that at the end of the, that relationship, he, he, he le she left him for another man. And then later, catch this, they hear that the person that she went off with, something must have happened in her life. She became indebted in some way, and now she was being sold. And God said, go buy her for me. That woman is you. It's funny how God will take some... Listen, do you know that the sovereign will of the Lord can be very painful? That God can use you to do something, right? Because, first of all, he, he thinks you're his anyway. So he's going to use you for his good pleasure. And, and how, how, I, mean, I, would never, I mean, I would never give that advice to anybody. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not here. I mean, I think you understand what I'm saying. You would, so don't act like I'm, I'm cruel and indifferent. You wouldn't suggest that to your boys either. You better hear from the Lord. If, 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 you better know God has to appear to me like in person. I'm just saying, right, right, I got a little grandson and godsons, God better appear to me uh, before I ever give that kind of advice. But I just want you to see that the woman was him, so sh she was bought out. She was redeemed. You were redeemed. And you, if anybody was unfaithful, it was you. So we start with that premise. We start in the premise that God bought me. 
the, the, this, the, 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 the idea is that you were useless until God made you useful. You were value, valueless, but God made you valuable. That's the preaching of the cross. The preaching of the cross is, you know, we're in a generation now where people will say, oh, you know, God, I was a diamond in the rough. No, you were not a diamond in the rough. You were as worse as they come. I've heard songs say God saw the best in me. He did not see the best in you. He saw the worst in you. And he bought you anyway. Now, it would be, it would be somewhat of a distinction. It would be somewhat of a distinction. In fact, let me just read this to you. Can I read this? 1 Corinthians 6. So I want, you to, I want you to see this, and, and I'm going to get into some actual scriptures on redemption, but I just have to set this premise. He says, what? This is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with the price... Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me take you over to, to 1 Peter. Go with me to 1 Peter. And I, I love reading, I love reading this, particular, this particular passage, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. So, so Peter is, these guys are learning, and I want you to see that it's Paul who is, who is the, the expression of these values in your, in your gospel, right? That God buys you, right? And, th and, then, and then how many have ever, how many have ever heard as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot? So you were bought. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think, you know, when we think about the gospel, we think we know it, but you really don't know it <laughs> until you come to that crossroad and say, you know what? I was absolutely nothing until God purchased me. I had no value until God made me valuable. I had no future until God gave me one, right? So I tell people, listen, God's not, God's not gonna start with you. He starts with Christ. Somebody say hallelujah. God's not gonna say, well, let me fix you up a little bit. I'm gonna put a suit on, I'm gonna put a tie, and I'm gonna give you some new shoes, I'm gonna give you King James Version of the Bible with big black red letter edition, you can walk around saying hallelujah. Hey, God, God doesn't start with you, he starts with Christ. And the day that you let go of yourself, you begin your gospel, you begin your gospel journey. The day that you realize that God didn't fix you, he redeemed you. You're unrepairable. You can't be fixed. Have you ever got that in your head? Listen, and you know you can't be fixed because you're still sinful. Can, can we be honest? The Bible says the man says he isn't sinning, we know he's lying. So if you're in here saying, well, Pastor, I haven't, I haven't sinned since I got saved. See, I know you're lying. I know for a fact you're lying. You are not fixable. You can't be fixed. Your, your, your flesh is, is corruption, magnifold corruption. You can't be fixed. I, I'm sorry, brothers and sisters. If you think that God's going to fix you, or God got, going to remake you, you don't understand the gospel. You were purchased. I'm going to get into some conversations here. You were purchased because God said, I'm starting all over. I'm starting all over. We start with Christ because you were purchased with blood. You were redeemed. You were bought back. Huh? Everything belongs in him. Somebody say, hallelujah, that's just amazing to me. Let's, let, let's, let's do this. So you saw the word, you saw the word, buy out, right? So redeemed means, to be redeemed means to be bought out, right? 
The word, the word, when I say redemption, pardon me, I said, use the word, let me, let me rephrase that again. The word redemption means to be bought out or to buy out. Now the word redeem, which is a derivative of that word, redemption, the word redeem means to be ransomed. So somebody had you, somebody had you as a slave. I don't want to tell you who he was because he used to be your dad. You know who he is, right? You know who your daddy used to be, right? Was the devil. Lucifer was your daddy. And, and he said, listen, I'm not going to give you up for free. So God came and purchased you from the devil. <laughs> you were ransomed. You were a slave. Listen, how many know, how many know, how many know Paul always said, if, if you continue sinning, then you're still owned. You're still, you're still mastered by right? The master, right? That's, I mean, that's, to me, that's just incredible conversation. When you really, when you start thinking about it, you say, man, that's just incredible what Jesus is teaching. Now, now, uh, check this out. Go with me to St. Matthew. We'll get into the words of the Lord, and I'm just trying to build some, so write these notes down, because this is important that you understand, because, you know, sometimes, I don't know if, 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 this is just my experience. I'm just gonna, I'm not saying that this is true always. Please don't take this as a this at this being like locked tight, you know, and and it never happens outside of this course or this action. But most of the time, when I'm, you know, when people are getting saved, they're getting saved because they're in a fix. Now, if you grew up in a Christian home, praise the Lord. How many know? How many know that mo almost eighty percent of all Christians are Christians because they grew up in a Christian home? How many know that people past the age of 50, it's like, I want to say it's maybe 2 or 3% get saved past 50? Just, you, you grow up outside of a Christian home and you, you don't know where those things come from. You know where, where they come from. You, you say, well, listen, I got good news for you. God's going to start new. The old life is over. He begins a new life. I'm going to say amen. That's amazing. That's where those, that's where those, con those, those are the, the context of that. That's where it comes from. Look at St. Matthew 20. Jesus says this. Jesus says this quite nicely. St. Matthew chapter 20. I'll start here at verse 25 just to put it in context. That way you can see it. St. Matthew chapter 20 verse, this St. Matthew chapter 20 beginning here at verse 25. It says, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Right? So whoever wants to be great, let him become that, you know, that, let, him, let him minister. Let him be the worker. And whoever, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be what? Your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a what? Ransom. He was a ransom. He paid the price. Well, I said, well, what price? The price for you. To buy you back. To buy you back. God bought you. I, I, I hate getting into these conversations because I think when, when I say things like this, people, people get mad at me, right? When I say, you don't own yourself. You don't own you. You don't own your body or your spirit. You don't own nothing. You're, you are a slave to Christ. People get mad when you say that. I mean, you know, now, nowadays when you say slave, you know, we're in a culture of slave. Oh, God, don't ever say slave. <laughs> Brother and sister, you're a slave to Jesus. You're a servant. I know, I know it sounds odd, right, because in the culture, but listen, the Bible does it. The, when, 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 when the Bible was written, it was said, oh, well, temper down the words because in 2020 there's going to be a lot of political correctness. Listen, the Bible is the Bible. It's just the truth. It's always going to be the truth, whether you think it's contemporary or not. I tell people, the Bible's ahead of you. If you don't think so, read Revelation. <laughs> what I say, brothers and sisters, that listen, we were bought. You got to take that in, right? I'm so glad God bought, God bought me. 
I'm so glad I was redeemed. Somebody say hallelujah. I was redeemed. Redeemed in the Lord, right? Let me give you this last verse here. Galatians. Because it's already, we're almost 10 minutes away from closing anyway. We actually, we will probably stop here in a moment anyway. And, and pray and for each other, right? Galatians 3. Now, of course, you know, this is Paul. Getting right back into the same uh, convos we had before. So this, this is Galatians chapter 3. Yeah, this is, this is Galatians chapter 3. Now remember, we, you know, I, I, it'll be a while before I get down to justification. How, how many did they know that, just, just to give you a little preface before we get into this particular verse, how many know that justification means that in Christ you are right with God? Even though you know you're wrong, Right? That doesn't mean that you stop sinning. I'm not saying that. It just means that in the sight of God, you are righteous. Okay, I'm just, I'm, and how many know that that's by faith? Not by works. So important you get that. Everybody get that, right? Because God isn't starting with you. He starts with Christ. Right? There's no work for you to do. Because Jesus did the work. You are now justified. Now, I'm not telling you go out and sin. You're supposed to be holy. You're supposed to live right, right? But I'm, I'm sharing with you that in the sight of God, when God sees me, I am justified in his sight. I'm perfect. Not by any work that I've done, but the work that Jesus did. Right? Right? So I just want you to, I, I, I lay that down, that word, that just a little bit, give you a little taste of the word justification, because it's essential that you hear it when you hear this particular passage of Paul to the church at Galatia, he writes to them this, Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. I'm going to say amen. Listen, if, if, if you can memorize that, that'll, be, that'll probably be the biggest blessing tonight, if you can memorize that one line. It's not the whole verse, but it's enough to set you free. The curse of the law, you've been redeemed. You've been bought out of that. Right? Do you know, can, can I share this with you? You, and this is going to sound really weird when I say it. You are no longer under the accountability of the Ten Commandments. I could make theologically an argument that God, first of all, didn't give the Ten Commandments to Gentiles. He gave them to the Jewish nation. I could make that, theologically make that argument. But needless to say, every man, when they face God without Christ, will face the Lord under the curse of the law. Who could pass the test? Have you ever tried to pass the test? Anybody here ever lied? Yeah, yeah, you probably may lie today, maybe a couple of times. I don't know what it was. Could have been a little white lie, I don't know. Uh, I mean, just think, just, just think of the lying. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to put value on, you know, a hierarchy, because God, sin is sin, right? So I'm not trying to say one's worse than the other, but there's probably a lot of, a lot of lying, right? A lot of lying going on, right? How many know, how many know, how many know when you start going through the Ten Commandments that if you violate one of the commandments, you've violated them all? So even a, a, a lie or, or, or maybe there's even, maybe you've stolen something. I don't know, anybody ever steal something? Listen, I'm here to tell you that if you, if you weren't redeemed, the law would kill you. And it's amazing when I run into Christians saying they're trying to live by the Ten Commandments. The commandments will kill you. You're not supposed to live by the Ten Commandments. You're supposed to live by the Holy Spirit. And I know when I say that, people get just, it's like, oh my God, sacrilege. Listen, Peter taught this. The Ten Commandments will kill you. They were only a schoolmaster to show you how imperfect you are. It is the curse of the law. You were bought out of a curse. Somebody say amen to that. You might want to write that down. I'm just saying, I just think that's pretty special that when I meet God, I'm not under the, the Ten Commandments. You say, well, if you're not under the Ten Commandments, how's he going to judge you? In Christ. In Christ has finished the work. I'm going to be in heaven. Now, whether or not I got a little, small, little gold band around my head, or I've got a crown, that's, that's still in question. 
That's still in question for you, right? All the works that you say you profess you did in Christ, it'll be tested by fire. Yeah? When I'm going to be talking about eschatology, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, as the Lord would say so, maybe in a month, I'm going to take you through all of that stuff. We'll take you through the rapture. I'm going to take you through the judgment seat. This stuff is true. We're going to kind of do like a, you know, you got a, a fireman will come in and see if your house is fireproof. We're going to come in and see if your works are fireproof. You need that. You might be saying, man, I, I, I need to, you know, I need to make sure, put a sprinkler system in my spiritual work because it looks like some of the things I'm doing may not necessarily be for God. You have to fireproof what you're doing, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to get into that. That's eschatology, man. I'm going to teach it to you. Because we need, I, have to, I, I apply it to my life too. Somebody's saying, man, I'm not going to put on you what I won't put on myself. If, if anything, if I'm not even practicing, what kind of teacher am I? Right? Somebody's saying amen to that. So look what it says. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Well, who was made a curse? Jesus was made a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Are you there with me? That's right. The, the, the tree being an expression of the cross. Right? So, so remember Paul. Remember Paul says, Paul says, I only come to preach the cross. But think how rich that is. Some people think, well, you're going to come and talk about Jesus died every Sunday, every Sunday. Well, no, that isn't the, the preaching of the cross isn't that Jesus died. Right? The preaching of the cross is you've been redeemed, brother and sister. I mean, there's, a, there's richness in that. I mean, I could probably do three or four sermons out of just redemption. I mean, I could do three or four sermons out of propitiation, right? Just trying to show you. Look what it says. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through faith. Listen, so God took you back to the beginning. He, he started the process over. He says, well, we're going we're to go back to what I originally designed, a life of faith. Somebody say amen to that. How many know that, that, that Abraham wasn't reading the Bible? How many, how many know that Abraham wasn't reading the Bible? He didn't have a Bible. <laughs> Moses wasn't even, you know, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, right? The creation story, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. For all you scientists and people that are real, you're, you don't know, you know how it happened. You know, well, scientists say, but let, let me tell you something. Let me, let, me, let me break this down for you. God said something very unique about Moses. He said, when I speak to prophets, I speak to them in dreams and visions. But I don't do that with Moses. I talk to him face to face. As a friend talks to another friend. Moses heard the creation story from God himself. Just so that when you think you can dismiss that story as nothing, you better be careful. That's the voice of God. This is how it started, in the beginning. Right? When God, in the beginning, God created what? Light, revelation. The third and fourth day is sun and moon and stars. Listen, brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about light the way we know. I'm talking about revelation. You better be careful with God. That story is bona fide true. That's authentic. God gave it to him. Moses is unique in that sense. But before we got anything written, before that was even said, before we even knew that, God said, I want you to believe me by faith. Just want you to know that if I tell it to you, trust it. That's where we're back. We're back to faith. If he said it, trust it. You don't believe it can't be trusted? There's blood on it. Brother and sister, listen, be careful. <laughs> the gospel is the power of God. It's the power of God. We'll stop right there. Did you get those down? Listen, I've got a few more words to say on redemption. I'll share them on Sunday night. And then I'll get into the word propitiation. That's a profound word, to propitiate. And that's, that's wonderful. How many glad you came to church tonight? Amen. So glad to see everybody here. Amen. Appreciate everybody uh, tuning in to the uh, coming into the house, but tuning in by stream. Those that are watching by stream, we've got about, what, maybe five, eight chairs out. We had room for you, not a lot, but it's getting filled up here at Bible study. Can I encourage everybody to start making their way back to the house of the Lord? Uh, you, you can leave that there, Brandon. You don't have to, you, you, yeah, don't move nothing. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them be part of our, uh, 
offertory. So tonight, listen, we're, we're, we're picking up the offering. If you're there at home and, and you have your, your, your phone, your Android, go ahead and pull that out. Let's give uh, through your Tidely app. Those that are here tonight, if you want to give through your Tidely app, go ahead and do that tonight. If you need an offering envelope, just lift your hand, brother. I see Brother Connell's already handing those out. People are grabbing their envelopes and giving their special offering, uh, their tithing, if they haven't already done so. So we're exhorting uh, you uh, to give through a tithing envelope, maybe through uh, your, your Tidely app. I know that those that are watching, we always announce that you can always give online. If you're watching by stream, you obviously have, have uh, internet access. You can always go by harvestpointchurch.org. And in the upper right-hand section, there's a tab to give. Just hit that tab and follow directions. You can give through PayPal and through Tithely on our website. So go ahead and do that. Then, of course, we're always exhorting people to give. People are still giving by mail, which is really cool. Amen. People are still sending their gift, their tithe through the mail. And so that address is 1301 East Debbie Lane, Suite 102, Box 509, Mansfield, Texas, 76063. I'll repeat that one more time if you're watching by stream. That's 1301 East Debbie Lane, Suite 102, Box 509. That's in Mansfield, Texas, 76063. If you missed it, just wait till the stream's over and you can replay the message. Just fast forward to that little spot here and you'll hear me say uh, the address again on stream. Amen. So anyway, those that are giving, I see people are already giving their gift in the house of the Lord. Amen. Brother Connor, let's bless it, and then we'll, we'll bless those that give by, by their app, and we'll just, we're thankful for everybody giving. Thank you, everybody, for your gift tonight. Amen. We love you. Thank you. Father, we thank you for the gift that's given tonight. Father, great and small, Father, in your kingdom, uh, nothing is too small, nothing's too great. We thank you, Father, from, for the, the two pence that may have been applied here to the thousands. We thank you for it, Father. We know that you're the blesser and the giver of these things. We give them to you, Father, because we know this is our privilege. This is our duty. It's our action. It's our heart. It's our mind towards you. Father, I know you love a cheerful giver, and we give cheerfully. We don't give out of compulsion. We don't have to. We already are rich in you, and we give out of that richness. So we thank you for the gift in that. I thank you for those uh, that are faithful in it. Thank you for Brother Kano. Amen. amen. His steadfastness. Amen for helping us tonight, Father. As he collects it and counts it and reports to it. And so, Father, thank you for his life, too. Blessings in the name of the Lord on the gift and Brother Kano. Amen, amen. We put you in there, brother. Thank you so much. Amen. Okay, so let's do this. Let's get into some prayer time. All my elders left all at once. I don't know what happened. Uh, you, were gonna, you had a prayer request? Excellent. So uh, who else has a prayer need tonight? Prayer need. We got two, three, four prayer needs tonight. Very good. And then uh, we need to keep... Uh, Yesenia, God says some prayer. Uh, Anna, can you, can you stand for her uh, when we get ready? And then we need to keep Mary Galvan in prayer. Is anybody standing in proxy for her? Anybody was referencing her tonight? You were, were can you, you'll, you'll stand for her. So we'll keep Mary Galvan covered. We'll keep Yesenia, God says, co covered. Uh, and then I don't know if anybody else has any, uh, any other, uh, any, if you want to stand in proxy for somebody, we most certainly can. So let's do this. I'll start with you, Maggie, then I'll work. Brandon, we'll finish up with you on this side. Maggie, your, your petition. Um, I just want to ask for continued prayer for Brandon's mom. Her name is Rosa. Um, she's still in the hospital. Um, she got tested again for the cold. Okay. She's on negative, and now she's having fever. And okay. She's still in the hospital. Okay. So you said her name is Nellie? Uh, my friend's name is Nellie. Her mom's name is Nellie. Got Rosa. Right, there, Rosa. So recovering from COVID, very slow recovery. We need to... We'll pray her right out of there tonight. Amen. Uh, I was, I was going to share this with you. You know, Sunday morning when we prayed, uh, there was um, two people that requested prayer uh, through the, uh, when we got to the prayer on Sunday morning. Pastor Josh was having, the Lord touched him on Sunday when we were praying. And so did Amy. She sent me a text. Says, the Lord came over me. I felt the presence of God. She recovered, amen, from that issue that she was facing. So just to let you know, we pray people through Amen. Sunday. Listen, there's power when the people of God pray. We can pray Rosa right out of that hospital. We're going to do it tonight. We're going to declare the Lord. Did you have something? Go, go, go ahead. I think. Gotcha. We're going, we're going to pray health over Raul tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then, of course, we'll have you stand for Mary. Yeah. Uh, Irving? 
Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That's that's Ron Wooten. He heads up River of Life. They do a lot of work and labor in in the in Christendom in the house of the Lord all over. Yeah. So we got it. We'll lift him up. Amen. So back over to you. Uh, was there anybody in here? Okay. Uh, go go ahead. You said their first date? Yeah. Okay. And then the safety form for their hurricane. Right, yeah. I, I, I was going to end with that. Very good. So, so you know what, Brandon, we'll let you, you're praying. What in particular that they're having, celebrating their anniversary? Just kind of blessing? 20th anniversary of their first date together 20 years ago. Wow, okay. Well, we'll keep them in prayer, but, but we'll also pray. Uh, we, how many know that I, when I left church, I don't know, I think I heard that they said it was building up some momentum, category four. Yeah. I think they were thinking it was going to be maybe a two or three. Lord. Lord. Category five now. So we know what, that, there's no higher category than five. If I'm, if, if I'm not a weatherman, but I think that's, that's the highest it goes. <laughs> five would be catastrophic if it hit land at a five. That'd be really bad. So let's, let's pray for everybody in harm's way. Now I, I know that it's coming in through Louisiana. Is that still true? Uh, of state line of what? Texas and Louisiana? Okay. Yeah, it'll curve over to the East Coast. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, they showed a little bend in it. I saw that uh, this afternoon, but that was right before I left the church. So, okay. All right, so what, can, let, let's surround the ladies back there, uh, Ariana and, and uh, Maggie. And then, of course, who's ever in that circle, Elder Jeannie's there, so we got the ladies covered. Uh, Dad, you don't mind standing in with Irving and them. That way we, we keep that covered there. Irving's playing for a, a wonderful man in the Lord. We love uh, Brother Wooten. Uh, he's a beautiful brother in faith. And then why don't you jump over here? And then uh, what we'll do is we'll wait to pray for the hurricane, all of us together. But we'll bless your family on that side. There you go. Thank you, Jacob. Everybody will just kind of come together. And, and, but he is praying for health. For We think it's a health issue. So I'll, I'll turn y'all loose. Go ahead and begin to pray. Amen. Love you in the Lord, brothers. How great you are, Father. How great you are. How great you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Great is your name. Praise the Lord. As you're praying, if anybody's watching by stream and they need prayer, go ahead and leave it in the comment section. And we'll pray with you right away, right as soon as we get finished. We'll lift you up in prayer. Amen. If you need prayer, Man, if you need prayer, if you're watching by stream, if you need prayer, whether you're watching by Facebook or even by, um, um, by YouTube, we're here for you. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying for one another. Church family, can we, uh, can we tie in together? Let's, let's pray for the hurricane that's coming. Can, can we all just tie in together collectively as a church? I'll, I'll say a prayer just kind of corporately, but we can all tie in. Are y'all ready to pray with me? Can we pray together, everybody? Father, we lift up um, our country and, and our brothers and sisters and those that might be impacted uh, by this category uh, five, Lord, uh, hurricane. Father, you know every detail. Father, I need not even address, address you as such. You know every situation perfectly. Father, we pray safety. Uh, we pray your covering, your help. We pray over those in harm's way. I pray over those that, Father, wanted to, uh, through whatever issue. I pray for those that are on the road trying to get away from it. I, I pray every provision met, every need met, Father. I pray strength and help for every single person, over every child, over anybody. Father, I know that would be terrifying to be in, in the midst of a, a hurricane. And Father, I pray peace and calm and safety come over all of my brothers and sisters, all of the family of faith, all of my pastors and leaders and elders and the people of God that are in these states. That Father, I know you're going to surround them. You're going to keep them. You're going to use them to minister to others. That Father, provision would be made in their lives that they may minister to others. And we lift them up in the name of Jesus. We lift them up. We lift them up right now. We cover them by the blood of Jesus. And we thank you uh, for what you've already done and what you're going to do and of the stories we're going to hear of your care and of your goodness. Father, we pray that hurricane die. We pray that, that Father, we, we ask uh, in Jesus' name that that hurricane just begin to lose momentum. Uh, that, what, that what they're thinking is going to happen, Father, that it just die quickly. And we pray that, Father, for the care and safety of many people. We lift them up to you, Father. I know you love them even more than we love them. And so we pray help and strength right now. I bless the family of faith as they uh, get into their cars, as they begin to move and move back to their homes. I pray blessing on their lives. I thank you that uh, so many people showed up to Bible study. What a beautiful thing to see the family of faith. We love each other, and we're not the same when we're absent from one another. And so I thank you for our togetherness. I thank you for the blessing that permeates the house of the Lord and the strength that comes when we tie in and we're in agreement with each other. And so I pray blessing, help, and strength. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And Lord, thank you for answering us. Amen. We know we're going to see a good thing. Amen. Blessings to all of you in the name of the Lord. Love you in faith. Amen. Love you in faith. Love you in faith.